works thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder that passed through all the universe this sin then sings my soul my Savior to Thee Father, we thank you for today. You always speak to us. And thank you for this grace. And that today also, we are here to listen to that say yes, the Lord. Let this word bring through true and genuine revival. That we will not be just hearers, but we commit ourselves also to doing. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We welcome all of us to the throne room assembly of God. It's an honor and it's a privilege to have you here today. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. And we bless him for what he stands for us. I am also grateful to our Facebook audience. Let's put our hands together to welcome our Facebook audience. Despite our challenges, they still stay committed to us, and we are grateful. The Lord honor and richly bless you for your commitment. We pray that the moment you see our notification, you share the video so that somebody also will be blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. We'd like to continue our series on the urgency of God's word. The urgency of God's word. The, the speed with which we should attach to God's word. Let's turn our Bible as we did last week to John chapter 9 and then from verse 1 to verse 5 we'll read it says that as he went along he saw a blind man from birth his disciples asked him Rabbi who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world... I am the light of the world. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. We said last week that 
your attitude or what you do determines how much time you have. That when you see someone hurriedly doing something, it tells you the person has no time or it's an indication of no time. If you are slow in doing things, it suggests to you or it tells onlookers or people who are watching that you have so much time available. So, for example, when you wake up in the morning and then you know you have to catch a bus at 7 o'clock in the morning, you woke up at 5, but something happened and then you, you overslept again all by your own actions, you realize that at 6.30 you were not ready, you have not set off, you are not doing what or you are, not no, you are nowhere near what you should be doing to catch the bus, you realize that you are always in a hurry to get yourself fixed. Praise the Lord. So what you do, for example, you are going to sell, you know, and then you, have, you know that by 6.30, customers will start coming to your place where you sell either food or cocoa or something, and, and that the customers will be there by 6, 6.30. So at 6 o'clock, at least, you should be there. By, and, and then you realize that it is already 6.15, 6.20. The food is not ready. If you are not careful, you will hurry up and serve the food not properly cooked because you don't have much time. Praise the Lord. So your actions will tell us whether you have time or not. And so we say that as Christians, what we also do tells us that we have time or we have no time to do God's work. Hallelujah. Your actions, you know, towards God's work tell us that you have time or you don't have time. And that for us Christians, we should urgently work for God because we don't have time. Amen. Remember we said that this story about um, Jesus and this blind man is a continuation of chapter 8 where Jesus was fleeing from the mob who took stones to stone him and the disciples. And so they got to a point where probably, I'm not sure, they were too far away from where the mob action was about to take place. And so when Jesus saw the blind man, usually as his custom was, he stopped. Bible says he saw the blind man. And we explained that the word saw, as was used in this passage, is not just seeing somebody, but it means Jesus stopped and was staring at the blind man with the intention to attend to him. Praise the Lord. So when Jesus stopped and was looking, his intention was to get something done for the blind man. He wanted to attend to him. And when the disciples saw the action of Jesus, they asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parent, that he was born blind? Praise the Lord. And we said that the answer Jesus gave this disciple was what was informing us to learn this topic, the urgency of doing God's work. Amen. And like I said, my objective is that at the end of this sermon, we would attach urgency in doing God's work. Amen. You know that at the end of this sermon, when we finish with this series, uh, you would be fired. You see, the point is that the truth of the matter is we don't have time. And one day, one day, one day, one day, all of us will be called to account for our stewardship with time, which we had on this, in this world. And I pray that when that time comes, you would have something to tell him. Praise the Lord. You see, we have so much attached our energy and strength in making money good. But there's coming a time, like we saw some time before, that the money and the material things you have gathered, the buildings would play no role because when the Son of Man rewinds or starts time again and that we begin eternity, those things will be of no value. But the work you did for him, 
is that which will begin to reign. I pray that you would attach that agency it deserves to do in God's work. So that you can also motivate others to do it. Amen. I mean, this is March. Missions month. And it has ended approximately. And that we have not been able to win a soul for God. I pray that God would help us so that we all will attach agency. Sometimes, because of our work, we will skip church on Sunday. We will, we will skip church on Sunday and go to work. Some of us don't attend departmental meetings because of our work. Our work. Even when you slept at, say, 12 midnight, by 3 a.m., you are awake to attend to your work. That is how important, important your work is to you. But I pray that God will touch your heart and my heart that will attach the same importance to doing his work. Because we realize that, that very soon the time or the duration allotted for us to work will end. Hallelujah. We saw that God has time designed for man to work. And that time is in the hands of God. That time allotted for his work is not in your hand. It resides in the hands of God. And he determines the movement of the clock. And one day it will soon end. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, as long as it is day, I must do the work of him. Or we must do the work of him that sent me. Jesus said, he, Jesus could have said, I must. But he pluralized it to say that we, it is all of us who must do the work of him that sent him. You are included, I am included. It is not only the pastor whose duty is to preach about Christ. Praise the Lord. It is not only the leader whose duty is to preach about Christ. It is all, our, it's about our duty. Praise the Lord. It is for all of us to get up and do something for him. Today, you can count maybe tomorrow, but you don't have the time. And the time is now. Jesus said, a night is coming when no one can work. A night is coming. Or night is coming where no one can work. Night is coming where no one can work. This night is that period or that epoch where man is seized from working. Where God would put an embargo on your effort to work. You would have the desire to work, but God would take it away. The scripture says night is coming when no one can work. The construction or the author did not say when no one will work. When he has used when no one will work, then it then presupposes that to work, then would the, or the decision to work is your choice. Hello? If the author has said when no one will work, in other words, you at that time would deliberately decide not to work. So the decision to work would then be in your control. But the author did not use that. He said can. In other words, meaning ability. Praise the Lord. So there is coming a time where you will desire to work, but you will not have the ability to work. 
the decision would be in your heart that I want to work. I want to do something. I want to rise up and work. But the scripture says you cannot work because an embargo has been placed on your life. You had the opportunity and the time to work, but you did not use it. It is not now. God will tell you, I gave you ample time. I gave you enough time, but you did not work. This time, it is for no man to work. Praise the Lord. Night is coming, but can I announce that the scripture says, night is coming. You know, it uses, if you like, um, the English will tell you that it is in the present perfect past or the present perfect uh, verb which says that night is coming in other words it is in already in the process praise the lord night has already started coming it is approaching and when that time comes once the night reaches you you cannot work. You would desire to work but you cannot work. I don't know where or the location of the coming night right now. Maybe he is about two doors away from you. Maybe ten doors away from you. Maybe a kilometer away from you. Maybe a thousand kilometers away from you. I don't know. And you too do not know because you don't control it. But the best you can do is to do it now. The night is coming. And no one can work. Even if you are so zealous, inspired, fired up, and motivated to work, in your heart, you know you want to work. Jesus said, no man, no man can work. Because the day which is allotted for man to work has passed. And now we are in a new era, in a new period, which is called night. No man can work. No man. No man. If you are not doing anything, child of God, I entreat you. Maybe you're also watching on Facebook. In your church, you are always fighting pastors, fighting leadership, and not doing anything. My advice is that get up and do something, because today it is the time to work. It is day and it is the time allotted for you to work, because night is coming. Already it has started. On the way, I cannot tell or determine its speed. Maybe the night, but you see, from the events of this world and happenings in the world, I can say that the speed of, of night is like uh, about 270 kilometers per hour. Coming with a very top speed. There is no time to waste. Amen. Today, we want to continue and to understand that we have to attach agency again in working or doing God's work because with our limited stay on earth, with this short time you have, you control the destinies of many. Praise the Lord. The destinies and the lives of many are in your hands. So as you refuse to work, you are depriving people of their freedom, of their liberty, of their healing, of their going to heaven. You are deliberately denying them the opportunity to also experience the grace you have. 
on that day, many would cry before God. Yes, you may be saved, but you would know that you were so wicked to yourself, you did not work. You would know, you would know that there were so many things you could have done. Just imagine that in your workplace, probably, you work in a bank, you know, and that uh, for security purposes, maybe two of you have access to the, the, the key and whatever security code to open the bank. And that you know that you should report to work by, say, 7 o'clock. Get your office set, bring your money from vote, distribute to your cashiers or your tellers, so that by 8, depending on your company policy, you start work. And that you, the one who has the security code, who stay at home, and decide to report like 9 o'clock in the morning or 10 a.m. in the morning. What do you think you are doing to your bank? And what do you think you are doing to the customers that deal with your bank? Some of them probably would be on the verge of dying because they need to withdraw to buy some medication to survive or they need to withdraw to pay for their hospital bill before they attend to them. Or there is an emergency they have to attend to. But because of your lackadaisical attitude towards work, you are destroying their lives. And that is what some of us Christians are also doing. There are some people, we passed them yesterday. They are gone. We saw them yesterday, and today they are no more. Just three days ago, we saw them, and today they are no more. Just last week, in my community, we lost a very handsome young man. And just some few days, I have offered him a lift to town. I like four days, like four days, four days. I had offered him a lift. Just four days on, after a short illness, he dies. The destinies of many lie in your hands. And if you will rise up and work, you would save those who are dying and perishing. Praise the Lord. God has given you that authority, that mandate to do it, to save lives. But here we are, comfortably seated, only thinking about what concerns us. But God, I pray, would have mercy on me and all of us. Oh, praise the Lord. Whether you have an offense in me or offense in somebody, it's not enough justification for God to spare you when the time comes. Praise him. You cannot blame your pastor for not working. You cannot blame your church leader. You cannot blame your choir master. You cannot blame whoever for your inability to use the day well. Oh, hello. Your inability... To use your time allotted for work. If God comes, you have no excuse whatsoever. Amen. Let's read verse 5. It says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Amen. 
while I am in the world, I pray that you would know that destinies are in your hands. Oh, hallelujah. That you know destinies lie in your hands. That many people are suffering. Many people don't have even what you think you have. That is not good. But I pray God will touch your heart today. That today you will not only be a hearer, but you'll be a doer as well. Praise the Lord. Jesus introduces another period. You know, in this passage from 1 to 5, Jesus has introduced three periods or three epochs. Three, you know, like we say time. First, he, he introduces the period of called day. That there is a period called day where it is allotted for man to work. Then he introduces another period, which is night. Now he says that while I am in the world, another period. So that he, is, he has a period for which he would live in the world. And there is coming a period he will be outside the world. He will no longer be in the world. So Jesus is saying, while I am in the world. Amen. You can analyze this sentence and divide it into two. Hello? Oh, is someone following? You can analyze the sentence and then you can clearly divide it into two. Number one is while I am in the world. That is the first part of the sentence. Right? And then the second part of the sentence is I am the light of the world. Two parts. But they all come together to tell us one thing. What is this sentence telling us? You will realize that the second leg of the sentence is explaining the first leg. Oh, hallelujah. Is someone following? You see, the second part, is it? Yes, on the board. While I am in the world, I am the light. So I am in the world. It's explaining why I'm, I am in, in the world. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. You tell, it tells you that this sentence is determining or is telling us the purpose of Christ Jesus in the world. Oh, hello. Is someone understanding me? This sentence is telling us the purpose of Christ Jesus in the world. That so long as he is in the world, he is the light of the world. Jesus is nothing in the world but the light of the world. Taken about purpose. It gives the reason why Jesus was in the world. Each and every one. Jesus is telling us that you are not in this world for fun. You are not in this world to marry and make children. You are not in this world to become a millionaire. You are in this world for a purpose, for a reason. And so long as you remain in the world, there is a tag on you to perform a specific task. Oh, hello. It's someone following. It's like today his service is dull, small. But you see, it's okay. It's okay. Jesus is saying that I have a reason and a purpose. Remember the disciples were telling him, let us continue to run from the mob who want to stone us. And don't waste time on this blind man because he is in this state because either he sinned or the parents sinned. Don't waste time on him. But Jesus said, my purpose is to give light to the world. So, so long as I am in the world, I have a visit, 
I have a mandate and I have a purpose. I am not going to listen to your words. I'm not going to listen to what you are saying. I will not be driven by your opinion and your suggestion. My purpose on earth is to fulfill the work of him that sent me. So long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So long as I live, I am the light of the world. What are you also in the world? You have a purpose and you have a vision. God brought you for a reason. God brought you for a reason. God brought you for a reason. You are not in this world for life or for fun. How are you executing that? But Jesus said, so long as I am, or as long as I am. Oh. Jesus, that one true God, came into the world, and you see, it says that as long as, in other words, the period allotted for me that I continue to remain in this world, I am the light of the world. So, before Jesus came, the world didn't have light. Oh, is someone hearing? You motivate me to preach small. It means before Jesus entered the world, the world didn't have light. The world was in darkness. The world did not experience light. But so long as he came, until he goes out, the world will still have light. Oh, Jesus. I pray that you would work urgently for him because you control the destinies of people. Jesus was controlling the destiny of the world and how the world should be shaped. Everybody depends on light. You need light, I need light. Once there is no light, you let the power go off. By four, five, six, the place will be dark and you go to bed because there's no light. Meanwhile, if there were light, probably you would have been doing something else. Your life depends on light. Many people also depend on you. Because Jesus said, as long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. The world without Jesus Christ means complete darkness. No wonder the world has rejected Christ Jesus, the savior of the world, the light of the world, and the world is seeing anarchy, chaos, and complete doom. And we think that it is by politics that can solve it the solution is Christ Jesus and how can the world know unless you and I take that urgent step in telling the world what you need is the light called Christ Jesus the world is in crisis we think it is the failure of the financial system. It is not failure of the financial system. It was someone's creation. It was someone's mind. It was deliberate just to cause harm. But if Christ Jesus was in that person, or if Christ Jesus were in the group of persons who orchestrated some of these things, I am sure that would not have happened. If Christ Jesus was in the heart of the Russian president, if Christ Jesus was in the heart of the Ukrainian president, if Christ Jesus was in the heart of the world leaders. I am sure the innocent will not be dying in Ukraine. The innocent women and children will not be perishing in Ukraine because they live without Christ. Because the light of the world is not in them. And all that they see is complete darkness. It's absolute doom. But Christ said, so long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I control the destinies of many and so are you in Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 the scripture says for you also are the light of the world a city 
built on the hill cannot be hidden. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. You too are the light of the world. Yes, Christ Jesus is dead and gone, but his spirit lives in you and he has made you the light of the world. The church is the light of the world now. And very soon, very soon, night is coming. Night is coming where no one can wait because the light of the world would have been taken out. That is the church. That is you and I. What are we doing to present the light to the world? Because many depend on you. That is the reason for your existence. You are the light. Jesus said, as long as I live in this world, I am the light of the world. As long as I live, I am the light of the world. This blind man needed something. What did he need? What did he need? He needed light. Hello? Because he was born blind man. From birth, he was blind. So he had never in his life ever had any experience with the light. But Jesus said, I am the light of the world and this man needs me. Uh, I am the light of the world. And what this man needs is the light. So, so long as I am here, I must offer my assistance and help. He needs me. I am the light. He wants to see because we can only see when there is light. Sight is possible when the rays from the light enters your eyes. So without light, you can't see. So Jesus said, this man needs light. And so long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And I must work every day to bring assistance. What are you also doing? We control the destinies of many people. Your delay in working your delay in doing the work of God is resulting in many people living with blindness, spiritual and physical blindness. Your delay in working for God is driving many into hell. Your delay in working is ruining the lives of many. Some people think, eh, the pastor wants members in the church that's why he's telling us to evangelize. Far from it. Far from it. So long as you are a Christian and live in this world, you are the light of the world. And you must rise up and do it. Do it in agency. Because there is coming a time the time God gave you to work would be terminated, will end. And there will be a time you would desire to work, but there will be no work. Let me tell you a story. Last week, my teenage pregnancy plantain tree fell. You know teenage plant, uh, pregnancy plantain? You see the plantain tree, very short, very slim, no water, and then it has fruit. <laughs> the fruit become very, very small, skinny, lanky, you know. <laughs> so I was, I was surprised. Like, it was funny when I saw that plantain fruit. And I, at least, let it grow. Jesus said, let all grow together because there is a harvest time. So I was waiting for the harvest time. And then last week, I saw that it, the tree has fallen down. I don't know why. But interestingly, I didn't know when the tree fell down. But where I live, I have a lot of stray goats. 
who come to eat on my compound. Plenty of them. We try to build the wall. They will kill the wall, jump on it. Very stubborn. I didn't know when that thing fell. So one day, I was just walking around, and something drew my attention to see that plantain. I said, wow, this plantain is matured. Though you see that the fingers are very short, but very plumpy, like matured. So I said, hey, then I am blessed, though, because I didn't know when it fell, and it, it is still intact with all these goats around. So something prompted me to harvest it. But for some reason, I did not. I forgot. Two days later, I was washing my car. And then my attention got to it again. And something said, I told you to harvest this. I said, hey, where are the goats? Today, why has the owner or the owners killed or sold all of them? So I said, oh, when I finish... Oh, uh, the key is here. When I finish, I will go and harvest it. I forgot. I started weeding. My attention came to it. Oh, I have the cutlass. When I finish, I'll go and harvest. I thought I had the time. I forgot again. And just last Friday, I went home. The day I refused to harvest it. I went home, and the moment I got there, right there in the dark, my attention got to it again. So I took my flashlight to point where the plantain was. And that day, the goats were freed from their pen. They devoured everything, including the leaves of the plantain. Everything. Everything. See what has happened? At least, I could have had some plantain this week. But now, I have to buy if I want to. If you think you have time to waste, maybe put yourself in my shoes. Because there is coming a time, there is coming a time, you would desire. In fact, that Friday when I got there, I wanted to scale my wall to go and harvest. Even in the dark, I went there with my torch to see if there were some few fingers even left for me right there in the mosquito-infested area in the dark. But there was not even one. The small, small, small fingers that you see hanging, the small ones, even that one, the goats have eaten it. Not one was left for me. If you think you have enough time, wait. Brethren, you don't have that time you think you have. The devil has made you believe you have time. The devil has made you believe, oh, there is more time. Oh, there is more time. But Jesus started his work when he was 30 years. He worked for just three years. He knew that his time was short. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 90 said, Lord, Teach me to number my days so I can incline my heart unto wisdom. If you know the days allotted for you, probably, I'm sure, you would be zealous to work. But the mystery is that God has hidden that away from us. How much time do you think you have? In that same psalm, we are deceived to think that, oh, for man, it is allotted 70 years and more. So you think you will live to 70. Deception. Deception. Especially if you live in Ghana. Especially if you live in Ghana or Africa. Today, in Ghana, I think the age expectancy is around 50 years. But even that, it is not a guarantee to tell you that you have 50 years to live. It's still a mirage. There are people who are dying younger than 45, younger than 30, younger than 60. Many people 
are just going just like that. So if you are alive today, it is telling you that it's an opportunity to work. Praise him. If you are not dead and are alive today, what? just imagine, just imagine, just imagine with the way you are working for God, the way you are working for God. Just imagine tomorrow or right after church, you, you, you felt some pain or some easiness, uneasiness in your body and then you went to see the doctor and the doctor said, oh, we have diagnosed you with this terminal disease and that put your house in order just like God told Isaiah, uh, the prophet Hezekiah. And that in two months, in two months, I am going to die. Two months. What do you think would be your attitude towards God's work? Hello? Please, did you get my question? With how you are working for God now, assuming that you fell sick just after service, and then they took you to hospital, and the doctor said, oh, with what we have diagnosed, you have just two months or one month to live. What do you think? What do you think? Even if you were a bank manager or you were the United Nations Secretary General, you will stop your work and now be praying for people, be distributing tracts. It tells me, oh, we won't do that. Maybe it's my thinking. But when you are What will you do? I want to get your answer. Auntie Vero, what will you do? Uh, she says she will do God's work. So now that she's not doing it the way she would have done it, is it deliberate on our part? Yashada. Hello? Oh, am I not preaching? Is it deliberate that we are not doing it? The time is not on our side. The time is now. Don't wait until doctor tells you you have two months to live before you do something. There are people who have just died when nobody even imagined or would think death or smell death about them. But they just went. Why? Because the night is coming where no one can work. The night is already in motion and is coming. When it gets your turn, even if you want to work, you will not. There are many people in our hospitals just praying that God will spare them and give them another day just to go outside the hospitals so they can tell people, repent and don't make my mistake. But they don't have it. Because night is coming where no one can work. Just imagine the person who has been sentenced to death, that criminal who heard about the word of God and did not re repent. Now he is in prison. Probably, probably, because the time has come for the state to execute him. He's repented. Great, good news. He's born again. Good news. But now, he just wants that opportunity to have somebody to tell him that you too repent and don't make my mistake. But he does not have that opportunity. Why? Because night is coming where no man can work. He desires to work, but he cannot. May you not be found in that situation. May I not be found in that situation. The time is now. We don't have time to waste. We don't have enough time on our hands. It is now. It is now. Shall we bow our heads and let's pray. Oh, Jesus, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried, tried and true, true. Ooh, oh, with thanksgiving. 
I'll be a of God, maybe you are here. You are watching on Facebook. You have realized that you are wasting the time. And you know you could have done better. And as we have said that this year God should revive his work. You want to pray and commit yourself to God and say that God now do with me, I am ready. I am willing. If you are here like that, if you are watching on Facebook, and you want to say that, God, I want to make a commitment to you. I want to make an, a, a covenant with you that this time I will do it for you. Kindly be upstanding. I'll pray with you. If you are like that, stand on your feet. I'll pray with you. You want to make a commitment to God that, Lord, this time, I would work for you no matter what. I would work it. I would do it. I have realized I don't have time. Please be on your feet. Be upstanding. If you are like that. At Saddam Waha, you have realized that God, I am not, I'm not, I'm not working for you the way I should. And I want to. Recently, we buried uh, Secondary District A. We buried our missions rep. And this man worked indeed. He worked. He was, he, the name evangelist on him was really deserving. And one thing that surprised me was that he planned, he planned a crusade at BU to establish a church there. He realized that the mother church was not pulling. So he himself, with his own money, commissioned the carpenter to build a platform which could be used for the crusade. He looked for a venue for the new church that would be born. When the carpenter brought the platform, he realized that it was too small. So he asked him to go and enlarge it. The carpenter brought it on Thursday. The day, on one Thursday, the carpenter brought it. The day the carpenter brought the platform, that time, the man, Evangelist Kofi, was in the morgue dead. He had the desire to work. But at that time, the carpenter has brought the stage, ready for crusade, but the person is no longer available. Don't wait. Don't wait. You too. If you are on your feet, put your hands on your chest. And let's pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, today I make this commitment to work for you with the needed speed. Lord, help me. Help me. Not to waste the time any longer. Put that urgency in my heart today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. We honor you. Thank you for your word. Lord, we are in your hands. That will not be hearers only, but doers only. Revive your work in our days so that years ago when we sat in Trotro and preached the word of God, when we sat in buses and preached the word of God, when we passed by people and gave them tracts, oh God, we'll go back to those days because time is not on our side. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope I was a blessing to you. Take your quality offering. 100 cities, 200 cities, 50 cities, 20 cities, 10. And all that. Let's pray.
Father, in your name we are given. We are not given to man, but to you, Lord. You have attached all manner of blessings to your word concerning giving. It is my prayer that as we are giving, giving from our hearts and giving generously, let the blessings you have declared on giving come upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As the choir sings, let's come with our offering. Lord, prepare me. We'll start from the back. To be let's, let's bring our offering. If your tithe is ready, if you brought your tithe also, kindly bring it, let's pray. 